It's a great blessing to be with you today and to be able to preach to you. And I think I mean that more today than I probably have ever done before. It's a great privilege to be here to be able to preach this morning. So will you turn with me please to the passage we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and to this very, these very well-known uh, words that the Apostle Paul has said. That they constitute an outstanding example of how Christian thinking completely is opposite to the thinking of the culture we live in. The culture we live in emphasizes being strong. It tells us to look within ourselves and find our inner strength. The gospel tells us to recognize our weakness and to look to God for strength. One of the sad things that we have to reflect on is that too often the church has tended to follow the culture rather than what the Lord says in his word. That was the problem in Corinth. False teachers had come into that church which Paul had founded and nurtured and they had brought all sorts of uh, different values and deviant teachings. And in particular, Paul had to refute a number of false accusations and lies that were being leveled against him by those false teachers. You can read all of those uh, back in chapters 10 right through to chapter 13. Paul goes into some detail. And in particular, one of the things that they uh, said about Paul was that whereas they had had wonderful experiences of visions and all sorts of things from God, Paul never talked about those things because he never had them. That's what they said. And so Paul answers them here in chapter 12. And he does so with great reluctance. You, you see that in verse 1. He says, It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. And then he describes something that had happened 14 years previously. And that's this remarkable experience he had of being taken into heaven, into paradise, and seeing and hearing these most remarkable things, things he couldn't talk about. Because, you see, those ridiculous books that are so popular where people talk about going into heaven are sheer fantasy. Heaven isn't a bit like they describe. It's far more glorious, far more awesome, far more staggering. And Paul has gone for 14 years never saying one word about what he had experienced. He had kept silent Because, you see, he followed a different way of thinking, a different culture from that which prevailed in the culture he lived in, that which prevailed amongst these false teachers, and that which is all too common in the modern church and in the day in which we live. There are three lessons I want us to see uh, in this passage, verses 7 to 10, uh, for our help and encouragement this morning. They are these. How God keeps us from sinning. 
how the Lord satisfies us with his grace. How he uses our weaknesses. Someone has said of these five verses, the passage is one of the most potent in the whole of the New Testament. And so it is my prayer that what we look at this morning will be potent in your experience, will speak to your heart, speak to your mind, speak to your lifestyle, speak to your values, speak to the way you think. So let's look at these verses and we will just work our way through them and see what they have to say to us. And the first thing we see here is how Paul was stopped from sinning. You see, we have to grasp something very important. God's purpose for us is not to meet all our hopes and satisfy all our dreams. His purpose for us is far grander than that. It is to conform us to the image of his Son. And so often as believers, we lose sight of that goal and we become obsessed with our circumstances and the issues that are going on around us. But these verses are quite staggering in what they are telling us because they do take us into this different way of thinking. Having had all these extraordinary experiences, and this is only one of the extraordinary experiences that Paul could quote. He could have talked about four personal, face-to-face -face conversations that he had with the risen Christ, but he didn't. And he only talks about this one, to silence those who were causing trouble in the church. But having had that experience, he faced a tremendous temptation. Look at verse 7. He says this, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. And you notice, he says something twice. He starts this verse by saying, lest I should be exalted above measure. And then he ends the verse by saying, lest I should be exalted above measure. Because the danger of great experiences from God is that we can become full of pride. We can think ourselves something special. We can think ourselves above the ordinary run of believers. We can promote ourselves because God has been gracious to us. And the devil loves to put those sort of thoughts in our minds. He is never happier than when Christians are boasting to one another. That's one of the great dangers of pastors' conferences. I always had an ambivalent feeling about pastors' conferences because when you meet a pastor, they say to you, and how are things going in your church? And it's a brave man who says, well, actually, things are terrible, and I'm on the verge of packing in. Usually, we try to cover over the bad things, and we just pick on one or two good things. And we do that because we want people to think specially well of us, because that's pride. And pride is sin. And sin destroys ministries. And sin destroys Christian lives. And pride comes before a fall. And so God 
sent Paul a gift. That's what he calls it. Look at that verse 7 again. Lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. This thorn in the flesh, this messenger of Satan, was given by the Lord to keep Paul from sinning. So what were they? Well, I'm going to disappoint you, because I don't know. Nobody knows. And people in commentaries spend pages arguing for this and for that. And why do we need to know? Because the way God deals with you will be different from the way he deals with me. Because we have different personalities. We are made different people. We have different backgrounds. What we do know about what happened to Paul is this. It was something painful, something that grieved him, something that hurt him. The word thorn is not really accurate. It should be stake. Something that is driven in. A stake in the flesh. Something physical. Something real. Something really disturbing. A messenger of Satan. What does that mean? I, I don't really know. What I think it may point towards is that Satan took advantage. Satan was allowed to take advantage. Satan actually was caused to take advantage of the discipline that God was laying on Paul to keep him from pride and ruining his ministry. But what we do know is this messenger of Satan buffeted him. And again, that word may not be as clear as it could be. It means it tormented him. It troubled him greatly. It's the word used to describe what the soldiers did to Jesus when they smacked him across the face. They buffeted him. They swore at him. They mocked him. They spat at him. And Paul gets a taste of the sufferings of his Savior. But here is the point. This messenger of Satan does something extraordinary. The messenger of Satan is the means of Paul being kept from sinning. How extraordinary. How utterly irritating and frustrating to the evil one. His device was used to lead Paul into humility. To lead Paul into holiness. To keep Paul useful. What he wanted to use to destroy the apostle, God used to make him more effective. Because you see, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And the Lord was making something beautiful in the Apostle Paul. Something that would change the world. Something that would bless men and women for centuries to come. Something that would be so suitable for the people of God in Swindon on a Sunday morning in September 
over 2,000 years later. And God is making something useful in you and me. Something beautiful. Something to his glory. And he will use the most extraordinary means. Because his concern for you is greater than you can understand. His love and passion for your good is immeasurable. And if he has to use Satan himself, he will do so. Because Christ has authority beyond our understanding. And there is no power in heaven or hell or in the universe greater than that which the Saviour has. And that power is all directed at you and me. And it's all directed to keep us from sin, to teach us humility, to make us holy. And it's magnificent. It's wonderful. What a great thing it is to be a Christian, to have that power working for us and working in us. Because not only do we see uh, Paul being stopped from sinning, but we see Paul being satisfied in a dissatisfied world. Paul was cast wholly on God. And that's the best place to be. My grace is sufficient for you. And the word sufficient there is translated elsewhere as being satisfied. It's, it's pointing towards the fact that what God does for us is just right. It's absolutely suitable. His dealings with us has no deficiency, has no weakness, has no shortfall. He knows what we need and he supplies what we need. And we have to learn to think in those terms. My grace is sufficient. How often we say that, how rarely we really believe it. But it truly is undeserved favour. See what the Lord says. Verse 8 and 9. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul, you've been shown how weak you are. You can't cope with this stake in your flesh. You keep saying, it's too much for me, it's too much for me. You've prayed three times, it's too much for you. But my grace is sufficient for you. It can't be too much for you. Because I can give you all the strength you need. You will be perfectly supplied. The Apostle Paul learned that, you see. That's why he's writing this now. He's showing us how his thinking changed. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He says, the grace of God has made me able to be glad even though the stake is still in my flesh, 
even though the pain is frequently in my mind and heart. But whenever the pain comes, the grace comes as well. And it's in the weakness that I find grace. So one commentator on this passage has asked this question. Have you ever considered the possibility that your limitations and your handicaps prove to be the key to your usefulness in the service of Christ? Paul learnt that lesson. So he said, I'll gladly boast in my weaknesses because my strength is useless. The only strength I have is the strength of Christ at work in me. Because the grace that came to him was sufficient. It was satisfying. And it's got to be. Because you remember what John says about the Lord Jesus? He said of him, he is the only begotten of the Father who is full of grace and truth. And of his fullness we have all received grace for grace. Grace upon grace upon grace. And so Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. What does that mean? It means this. Grace to believe. Grace to overcome. Grace to defeat temptation. Grace to endure suffering. Grace to cope with disappointment. Grace to handle pain. Grace to obey the Lord. Grace to serve him. Grace upon grace. Grace to prove the sufficiency of Jesus. And I ask you, how satisfying is that? In a world with no meaning and no value, a world of infinite dissatisfaction, here we are. And he gives us more grace. And we are satisfied. We know that contentment. Because Paul, you notice and you remember, he prayed three times. And when we think of praying three times, don't we go to Gethsemane? And we think of Jesus praying three times. And it's important that we should do that because it's because of Gethsemane. And it's because of the cross that grace has come to us. And every time we find he gives us grace, it's a testimony to the wonder of his saving work. And maybe you're here and you're not a Christian. And you're saying, I can't relate to what you're talking about. Of course you can't relate to what I'm talking about. You have to go to the foot of the cross and see that you are a sinner. And look and see one dying for you. And cry out for mercy and find grace given to you so that you can trust in him and turn from sin. 
It's only believers who appreciate the reality of grace. But what a great thing that is. But it's a great challenge to us. It means I have to learn not to rely on myself. I have to learn to lean on Jesus. Oh, I know the world makes fun of that. But when you're fallen over and you're laying on your face, you shouldn't make fun of a man who's able to stand. And those who lean on Jesus find the most glorious support to stand in an uncertain and a failing world. And it's those who are satisfied with Christ and who are satisfied with the sufficiency of his grace who will understand what Paul is talking about when he therefore says, I will boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And that brings me to my final point. Showing a different perspective. Working out this different way of thinking. See, so often don't we say, if not to others, to ourselves, if only I wasn't, and then we list all our weaknesses. Or maybe we say, if only I was like, and then we list those people we know who seem to be such better Christians than we are. And what we do is we forget that we are who we are because God has made us who we are. And we have the gifts and skills we have because God has given those to us to use for him. And I'm who I am because God in his wisdom made me that way. And I am to be who I am relying wholly on his grace to serve him. And we are called to face difficulties. We are for, called to face great sadnesses. We are called to face severe discomfort. And what we're called to do is to accept those limitations, those weaknesses. In his great hymn, I saw a new vision of Jesus, Vernon Hyam describes an experience that he had when he was very ill. He suffered much of his life with, with very bad asthma, and he was a remarkable preacher, greatly used of God, particularly in Wales. And then he was very ill, and it looked as though his life was coming to an end. And he wrote these words. I stood on the shores of my weakness and gazed at the brink with such fear. T'was then that I saw him in Eunus, regarding him fair and so dear. And some of us know what it is to stand on the shores of our weakness and to gaze at the brink and to see something of Christ that is wonderful to know. And our weaknesses are sent to us to humble us, to keep us holy, and to lead us to see more of the Saviour. 
Because weaknesses are a magnifying glass to show us the great grace and wisdom of Christ. So Paul basically says this, the weaker I feel, the more I rely on the Saviour. And we sing about that so often in that excellent song, My Heart is Filled with Thankfulness, which we sang last Sunday, which is why we haven't sung it this Sunday. We sang this line. He floods my weaknesses with his strength. That's what weaknesses do. They put us in that place where we can only look to him and cry for grace. And what are these weaknesses? We need to be clear it's not our sins. It's not our disobedience. But it is these things. Paul lists them. Infirmities or limitations. Reproaches. Insults. Needs or hardships. Persecutions or mistreatments. Distresses or calamities. In other words, it's all the issues of life. It's all the things we face day by day. And are they problems? Or are they opportunities to prove the sufficiency of God's grace? That's what Paul says of them. I take pleasure in infirmities. Really, Paul? I take pleasure in reproaches. I take pleasure in needs. I take pleasure in persecutions. I take pleasure in distresses. How can you say that, Paul? For Christ's sake. Because in them, I find him. Paul would never have been the man he was if he hadn't had a stake in his flesh. And it may be for you that you are the person you are and you are going to become a person of greater usefulness to God because of your weaknesses, because of your limitations. And what we must learn to do is to face our weaknesses and serve him in them. We're going to sing in a moment these words. We go in faith, our own great weakness feeling, and needing more each day thy grace to know. Yet from our hearts, a song of triumph pealing. We rest on thee, and in thy name we go. Oh, can you say that? Will you say that? Do you say that? Do you know your sins being restrained? Are you satisfied in the sufficiency of Christ? Are you showing this different attitude? Can you say with Paul, when I am weak, then I am strong. May God give us grace to feel the power of his truth in our lives. Let's pray together. Our gracious God, we have looked at things that are astounding as we see the wonder of the Saviour ordering our affairs and even overruling and directing and controlling the powers of hell. And as we see him in the sufficiency of his grace, giving us power when we are weak, sustaining us when we are not up to the task we have to do. 
enabling us to be faithful in our particular calling. Oh, God, grant us that grace to delight in your dealings with us, in your holy providences, that we as humble and holy people may show to the world the greatness of our Saviour for your namesake.